Hello, hello. Wow, it feels like a month since we last had a lecture um, in this course. But let's actually look at, at what's been going on. Um, so I hope everyone had a great weekend. Uh, first of all, uh, these, the exams have been marked and assignment two is currently being marked. Uh, I am still waiting on the course to be split on D2L before I enter the exam marks. If you need to know your exam mark for like a really important reason, um, like course adding or dropping or work terms or like anything other than you're just curious, uh, you can send me an email or a message on D2L and I'd be happy to send you, you your exam mark individually. But uh, please don't everyone send me a message at once because uh, it'll be pretty overwhelming. But the exams were, were pretty well done. I think like something like 2% of the class failed or, or around there. So it's, uh, it, it was really well done. And the average was in the high 70s or, or early 80s. I can't remember exactly. Just one second, please. Okay, so here's where we are in the course, because I have actually like forgotten <laughs> what we were doing in the course. So back here uh, on October 8th, we had our last game theory lecture. Then we had midterm break. Then we had our mini max and alpha beta pruning and assignment three lecture on the 15th, which, oh my God, is like two weeks ago now. Then we had the midterm exam. And then in here, I needed one lecture to be kind of blank in here um, in order to make the assignments uh, turn up. And I, I was thinking of maybe just filling this with some busy work or a random lecture, but I, I assume you guys liked the fact that there was no extra stuff to learn um, last Thursday. So I left that one blank for you. Now what we're going to do is assignment three is due on Thursday evening. And so we have two lectures on evolu evolutionary computing and evolutionary algorithms. And then on Thursday, I'm going to release assignment four. Assignment four should not be that hard. Um, it's basically just you have to implement a genetic algorithm and all the settings and everything have, to, have been done for you. You just have to play around with the arrays. So as long as you're comfortable with array manipulation, then assignment four should be no problem. So today we're going to get into evolutionary computation. And actually, just before I did that, I wanted to read um, for, for people who aren't on D2L, one of the kind of hints I made for assignment three. So let me just, uh, I'm gonna be looking at my second monitor here while I read from D2L, uh, I read from Discord, sorry. So for assignment three, uh, no matter what, try to implement minimax before alpha beta and then print out the values of the root node actions when depth equals zero, like I did in the lecture. That will help you debug things a lot. It's almost impossible to debug minimax without this. So what do I mean by that? Um, let me really quickly bring up assignment three. So I'll go back to assignment three really quick. Open with Google Chrome. All right, so what I meant by that is when you're doing these examples right here, so for example, uh, depth one win right here, what you should be doing when you do your AI is you should be printing out, okay, I actually have this here for, yeah. So is you should try to print out the values of your minimax for each root node action like I did in the lecture. So for example, once again right here, it showed that, uh, if you put the, if you did action one of putting the piece in this column, then you got a value of 10,000, which means it was a win. But if you put it in any other column, it meant a value of zero, which means the game isn't over yet. Uh, if, we go to de if we go to two and I did it, then you can see here that you want to block Yeah, so you want to uh, put a piece here in action five in order to prevent the opponent from winning on the next turn. And so over here you can see that I have a value of losing or minus 10,000 for every single action except this one. So in order to know whether or not your, your minimax search is actually working or not, 
you should be in your alpha beta search or in your minimax algorithm you should say if depth equals zero print out the value and that's what this will do for you and you'll be able to intuitively debug um, how your algorithm is working without these print statements it's almost impossible to debug alpha beta or, or minimax so make sure you're getting similar values to mine with minimax with no custom heuristic function before you move on to writing your heuristic function and uh, yeah the second thing I wanted to uh, to talk about was even though your program is working properly sometimes it may take weird moves for example sometimes it won't take to the path to the quickest possible win this happens sometimes when minimax sees for example if you're gonna win six moves from now no matter what um, it might not take that immediate win so it won't care which move to take right now even though one of those moves is an immediate win in order to take the fastest wins you can tie break wins or losses by adding the same number of moves that it took to get the win or loss in your heuristic function so that's a bit of a mouthful but what do I mean by that well what I mean by that is the following here we're gonna to go to the blackboard real quick so if you're in your search right oh that's a terrible color for this so if you are in your search like this and you've got a situation like the following so let's say this is your um, your tree like this okay so let's say that your alpha beta or your minimax is going to detect that you're going to win um, here you're going to win here or you're going to win here right so it, no matter which move you take let's just erase this one for now let's pretend that that's that right hand side one doesn't exist so if your alpha beta thinks that it's going to win at all of these nodes no matter what you do you'd think that it would actually take this move right here because it's the soonest possible move but unless you've actually baked that into your heuristic function somehow then it won't do that all right so what you might want to do is for example record the number of moves that have been that have happened so far in the game so let's say I have a winning value of 10,000 and I, I get this win over here on move uh, or on on move or action uh, 11 of the game over here I'm gonna get my 10,000 but it's gonna be on action 10 of the game and over here I'm gonna get my value of 10,000 but it's gonna be on action 12 of the game okay so what I could do is subtract the action value from the heuristic value here and so this one would be worth 9999 this one would be or sorry this one might be worth 9990 right because it's 10,000 minus 10 which is the action number this one would be 9989 because it's 10,000 minus 11. This one would be 9988 because it's 10,000 minus 12. And so what I've done there is just a really quick example of how to choose the soonest possible win because this one will have a higher value than this one over here. So those are just two tips on the assignment. And this also goes into play when, you, when it detects a loss, especially. So for example, when you, want to, when you know you're going to lose the game given perfect play, you don't want to do just a random move um, because maybe your opponent makes a mistake and you're not actually going to lose the game. And so try and take the move that will make you lose the game as far into the future as possible, just to give your uh, opponent a chance to screw up. Okay, so those are the two tips that I had. And now let's get back to our actual lecture for today. Alrighty. Here we go. Time for the PowerPoint. If this will work. Perfect. Okay. So today we're starting a new topic. It's going to be new and exciting. And we're going to have two lectures on this and then an assignment. So today we're talking about an intro to evolutionary computation. Um, and we're also going to be talking about evolutionary algorithms. I had one class in the chat 
Grad students still need a new A3 zip file to print the Zobrist. Okay, I can release that today. Uh, apologies, I thought I said to, to just print that somehow, but I'll, I'll put up something for you for that. Uh, yeah, so today, lecture 11, we're going to be talking about evolutionary computation and evolutionary algorithms. So, what is the positioning of evolutionary computation? So, EC... Uh, so whenever I say EC or EA, that's going to be evolutionary computation, evolutionary algorithms. It's part of computer science. It's not really a part of life sciences or biology unless um, you're taking into account that it's sort of nature inspired or biologically inspired. But these are algorithms and so they are part of computer science for sure. Um, the, bio the biological motivation for these, which we will talk about, um, so biology delivers the inspiration and the terminology for evolutionary computation, but you're not probably not going to see evolutionary computation pop up in a biology course. So EC can be applied in biological research, but it has many, many possible applications. So just because it's evolutionary computation doesn't mean that it has to be applied to problems which are biological in nature. It can be applied to pretty much any problem, and we'll see on our assignment just how true that is. Um, we'll, in our assignment, we're gonna, have, we're gonna be solving five different problems with the same algorithm. So you'll write one algorithm, and I'll give you five different fitness functions, and it will actually solve five different problems just based on those fitness functions. So the main uh, metaphor for evolutionary, evolutionary computation is the following. So if we're, if we're drawing inspiration on biology, then here's the terminology we're going to be using. So in terms of computer science problem solving, we're going to have a problem, we're going to have a candidate solution, and we're going to have a quality or um, a... Uh, some metric for evaluating the quality of our solution. In evolution, these would be the following analogies. So the problem would be our environment. The candidate solution would be an individual in that environment. The quality of my problem-solving solution would be the fitness of the individual, right? So let's say we have rabbits out in the wild or some biological animal, right? So the environment might be out in the woods somewhere. The individual would be an actual individual rabbit trying to survive in the woods, and the fitness would be some high value if that um, rabbit was able to survive, or a very low value if that rabbit was maybe, um, if it was injured somehow and could no longer run, for example. So the quality is the, in terms of um, evolutionary computation, the quality or fitness, um, the quality in our algorithm is going to be the chance that that individual has for seeding a new solution. And we'll talk about stuff like parent selection in a future slide. The fitness in the environment, or in, in evolution, is going to be the chance of survival or reproduction. So here when we talk about fitness, it's, it's hard to attach an actual value on fitness in real life, right? Because the environment may change, the individual may change. So when we talk about fitness, the fitness is just the chance that the individual was able to survive and then reproduce. Because in the end, all that really matters for the continuation of a species is whether or not you've been able to reproduce. Doesn't really matter how you got there, but the individuals that reproduce are the ones that continue on. And if you've ever seen the movie Idiocracy, um, you'll know what I'm talking about, right? As long as you're able to reproduce, you continue on. And it doesn't matter how smart or how strong or how fast um, another individual was. If they don't reproduce, then they don't have offspring, right? So their genes are not carried on to the next, um, the next uh, generation. So we're going to give just a little bit of a, a history here to show you that this is a very old topic. So in 1948, Alan, is there anything that Alan Turing didn't do, right? He, he came up with everything. So in Turing, he said, uh, he talked about trying to put together some sort of genetical or evolutionary search. Now, I don't think he actually did the first uh, genetic algorithm or evolutionary algorithm, but he was talking about it back in the 40s, which is absolutely crazy. How did he come up with all this stuff? Um, in 1962, Bremerman talked about optimization through evolution. 
1964, Reckenberg talked about evolutionary strategies, which is another type of evolutionary computation. In 1965, um, Fogel introduced evolutionary programming, and that's what we'll talk about in next lecture. In 75, Holland talked about genetic algorithms, which is what we're going to be talking about today. In 92, um, Koza talked about uh, genetic programming. Actually, that's what we're doing next time. Sorry, not uh, what Fogel did. And, uh, yeah. Oh, and I, I still have the old, so <laughs> this course used to be called Computer Science 4752. Um, so that's going to be assignment four. That's, uh, wow, I can't believe I didn't change that date. But uh, there you go. So, Darwinian evolution. Why are we doing evolutionary algorithms in the first place? Um, well, what we are doing is we are actually going to be mimicking the process of natural selection. Okay? So these algorithms are going to be doing natural selection to try and come up with the best possible solution to a problem. So what do I mean by uh, Darwinian evolution? Please tell me in the chat, uh, give me a yes or a no if you've actually been taught uh, evolution or survival of the fittest or natural selection at some point in your academic career. Because it's not obvious if you've never been taught it in the right way. And I'm not going to teach it in the right way, I'm going to teach it in the computer science way, okay? So, all environments have finite resources. That's just a fact, right? In the, in the actual universe, we have finite resources. There's um, a limited amount of food, there might be a limited amount of space, a limited amount of water. So all environments have some finite amount of resources um, that organisms or individuals are trying to compete for. Life forms that are around, whatever life form it may be, have some sort of basic instinct or a life cycle that's geared toward reproduction. And what that means is that innately to all living things is in their code some want to reproduce, right? And now humans are a bit different. Like we've we've gotten to a point with our society where we know, you know, we don't have to reproduce. Maybe you don't want children, so you're saying, oh, I'm not a life form. No. What I mean is actual normal life, like not humans anymore, because we've gone course sort of past natural selection with our medicine and stuff. But animals and organisms have some sort of natural drive to reproduce. Um, so therefore, if, if we want to reproduce, if us as life forms want to reproduce, and the environments have some sort of finite resources, some sort of selection mechanism is inevitable, right? Because individuals um, are going to be competing for those resources, right? If there's one unit of food and two individuals, whoever gets that unit of food is going to survive. Like, whether we like it or not, nature is hardcore, right? If you eat, you live. If you don't eat, you don't live. There's no, like, soup kitchen for random, random animals in the wild. It, it's... There's selection happening, right? And that selection can have through actually you killing another animal or one animal starving or whatever. So individuals that compete for those resources most effectively have an increased chance of reproduction, right? So what that means is if you were the person who got the food or the water or the shelter and someone else didn't, then you are going to have an increased chance of reproduction. It doesn't mean that a more fit individual is guaranteed to reproduce. It's just that the ones that compete most effectively for the resources have an increased chance of reproducing. Okay? And so, fitness here, um, when we talk about the fitness of an individual, we, we might think of like, oh, this tiger has really big muscles, or we might think that um, an elephant is super strong, or, or a rhino has a really long horn or something like that, or a, a bird can fly really fast. But it turns out that in nature, there's no primary fitness function, okay? Fitness is a derived secondary um, measure, and fitness is, is actually just how well did this thing reproduce, right? We can't run a function on an animal and, and, 
and get us a fitness function. But we can see, oh wow, that, that animal had like 20 offspring and someone else had no offspring. Therefore, the one that had 20 offspring, for whatever reason, was just more fit to be that in that environment. So fitness in nature is this derived secondary measure and we cannot directly measure fitness. It comes from how well did the thing reproduce. So in Darwinian evolution, um, and I'll talk about phenotypes in a bit, but we have these things called phenotypic traits. So these traits are behaviors or physical differences that affect individual responses to the environment. They're partly determined by inheritance and they're partly determined by factors during development, okay? So for example, um, how good your eyes are might be a genetic, genetically inherited trait, okay? But um, it, that could also be a, uh, influence during your development, right? Maybe you have, you're, you're from a relatively well-off family in terms of the world, and you can afford glasses, right? So your, your eyesight got better during your development somehow, or maybe you learned something during your development. These are unique to every individual, and they're partly as a result of random changes, and we'll talk about what that means in a bit. So trait inheritance. In, if phenotypic traits lead to a higher chance of reproduction, then these traits are passed off to offspring. So they're inherited, okay? And so along with random mutations in, in the phenotypes, um, this leads to new combinations of traits, which can over time lead to more fit individuals. And more fit meaning that they will produce more, right? Because fitness is just how well did these things reproduce? Okay, so the terminology we need to know in terms of Darwinian evolution is the following, and this is going to translate directly into our algorithm definition, and all of these definitions are going to be on, well, they can be on the final exam. So these are very important. So a population is, uh, a population in nature consists of many, possibly diverse individuals, okay? We are going to have a population in our evolutionary algorithm. So combination of traits that are better suited for a given environment lead to higher chance of reproduction. So individuals can be thought of, of a, as a unit of selection, okay? So selection is happening at the individual unit and selection here means selection for reproduction. Variations occurring through random changes yield constant sources of diversity. And couple with the selection means that the population is the unit of evolution. So indiv individuals do not evolve. Populations evolve, okay? And so over time, evolution causes a population to, to have a higher fitness, which means that individuals in that population become more suited to that environment and have a higher chance of reproduction. So that is what um, we're talking about when we talk about evolution. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about genetics and warning, I am not a biologist. So I did junior high and high school, just like all of you. I did a four and a half year undergrad degree. I did a three year master's and I did a seven year PhD. And throughout that, I did not take a single biology course at any level. I always managed to avoid biology. So Please take this with a grain of salt. I had, a, I had an actual biologist look at these slides and they said that they were pretty much correct. So I'm going to read them and you're going, none of this like hardcore biology stuff is going to be on the exam, okay? The stuff about evolution, yes, but like genes and all that kind of stuff. No, I just want to put it here for those of us who are actually interested. I'm interested in this stuff. I just managed to avoid it my whole life. So the information required to build a living organism uh, is coded in the organism's DNA. So the genotype, this is the DNA inside an organism. The genotype determines the phenotype. Okay. So what that means is that your genotype, that's the actual DNA, that determines the phenotype, which are the traits that you get as an individual. So the genotype to phenotypic traits is a complex mapping. 
For example, one gene may affect many traits, and one many genes may affect one trait. Okay, so what this means is that if you have D a DNA sequence of A, C, G, T, whatever, okay, just changing one of those doesn't mean that all of a sudden your eye color is different, right? Your eye color may be this weird mapping between like hundreds of thousands of actual characters in your genome. And so it's a very, very complex mapping and it's not an easy problem to solve. You can't just look at DNA and be like, oh, that's why they can jump high, right? It's not that easy. So changes in the genotype may lead to changes in the organism. So maybe it'll affect your height or your hair color, but they also may not, okay? So if one thing changes, maybe you don't all of a sudden have three heads and breathe fire. So genes and the genome. So deoxyribonucleic acid or DNA um, and nitrogenous bases, uh, that is that forms your genome and genes. Well, your genome is all of your genes. So you have these four of those, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine right here. Okay, they form your DNA. Genes are functional units Genes are functional unit of stretches of DNA chromosomes, meaning that you take your whole DNA and part of those, those are genes, okay? The complete genetic material in an individual's genotype is called the genome. So if you've ever heard of the Human Genome Project, that was a project a couple of decades ago to actually map out the entire human genome. And that was a huge success um, and is leading to really cool advances in, uh, in genetics. So... Let's look, for example, Homo sapiens. So we are Homo sapiens. Um, the human DNA is organized into chromosomes. And the human body, human body cells contain 23 pairs of chromosomes, which together define the physical attributes of the human being. Okay? So typically, 23 pairs of chromosomes. Reproductive cells. So we have to reproduce somehow, right? How do we do that? So gametes, sperm, and egg cells contain 23 individual chromosomes rather than 23 individual pairs. Cells with only one copy of each chromosome are called haploids. Gametes are formed by a special form of cell splitting called meiosis. And during meiosis, the pairs of chromosomes undergo an operation called crossover. And this is really interesting. So in crossover, Chromosome pairs align and duplicate. And the reason I'm telling you this, all this, is because later on we're going to be doing all of this in an algorithm. And so this actually happens in biology. Sister chromatids attach at a centromere. Uh, homogulous chromosome pairs swap genetic material. So this is chromosomal crossover. We're actually going to be doing this. Um, and the chromosomes are pulled apart to form two new daughter cells. And these two cells will divide again, and the outcome is four new haploid gamete cells. So, what we have is we have the sperm cells from the father, we have the egg cells from the mother, and then we have a new person cell down here, which is a, cro a combination of the crossover from these things. Okay? After fertilization, the new zygote rapidly divides, creating many cells, all with the same genetic contents. Although all the cells contain the same genes, depending on, for example, where they are in the organism, they'll actually behave differently. This process of differential behavior during development is called ontogenesis. And all of this uses and is controlled by the same mechanism for decoding genes in the DNA. So, the genetic code then. All proteins in life on Earth are composed of sequences built from 20 different amino acids. DNA is built from four nucleotides in a double helix spiral, so A, G, T, and C. So if you've ever seen like a genetic code written down, it'll, it'll all be A, G, T, and C, and it has to do with these nucleotides. Triplets of these form codons. Each of this codes for a specific amino acid. And the genetic code is the mapping from codons to amino acids. Last thing, mutation. Occasionally, some of the genetic material changes very slightly during that process, okay? So 
your code is actually reproducing and repl sorry it's replicating itself when it goes to the, to copy into these new cells and that is an actual process that happens where all of these things are being copied somehow now i'm not going into the details of that but there could be error in that process okay so if you have error in the replication then what can happen is effectively a mutation of one of those genes an a could switch to a g or a t could switch to a c or whatever or maybe something in the environment causes that. Like if you have some nuclear blast or something or some radiation or some oil spill or something like that. Or a, a random ray for the, from the sun goes through a piece of DNA and, and flips a bit somewhere. Um, those mutations can happen. And this means that the child might have genetic material that's not inherited from either parent, but it's actually new. Those new genetic materials can be one of three things. They can either be completely catastrophic, so it means that the offspring isn't viable, right? So that means that, uh, for example, you might have a genetic mutation that causes um, someone to, uh, like a baby to die during birth or something like that. So that can be completely catastrophic. It can cause the fetus to fail and, and the life form to not be able to live. It can be completely neutral, meaning that it doesn't affect your fitness at all. You have no idea. You probably have a ton of mutated cells in your body or mutated DNA and you're not even aware of it. Or it could be advantageous. So this, this um, strong new feature might occur based on that random mutation. Okay, so here's some important notes about evolution. Individuals do not intentionally change themselves to suit an environment in terms of their DNA. You might learn something about your environment, but there is no learning involved in the process of evolution, okay? It is a process of random mutations and reproduction causing possibly new organisms to be more fit to live in an environment. And what that means is, Fit individuals reproduce, and unfit ones don't. And so, good traits of parents are passed off to offspring, producing individuals that are fitter than either parent. So, um, what that means is, for example, if the father may have been really strong and the mother was really fast, maybe now you have a, uh, an offspring that is really strong and really fast, right? At, at a very hand-wavy type of level. Random mutations can produce new traits. So for example, maybe you have a random mutation that causes you to have, I don't know, six fingers instead of five fingers. And maybe you are in an environment in which six fingers is hugely beneficial to you, right? And so people who have six fingers are going to survive more. But you didn't learn to have a sixth finger, right? You were just randomly given one um, by evolution or by mutation and then what happened is the person with six, six fingers was so fit they got all the um, the chances to reproduce and so this pro this process produces more fit populations and here's probably the most famous example of that uh, let me know raise your hand there in the chat if you've heard of the peppered moth uh, example before Has anyone heard of this? Sometimes people have, sometimes people haven't, it's okay. But here's what happened. This took place in the UK during the Industrial Revolution. So the Industrial Revolution looked kind of like this in some manufacturing sectors. And this was like one of the first examples of evolution that happened in a time frame that could be observed by humans. Usually evolution happens over thousands and thousands of generations and you don't necessarily see, get to see the effects, sort of, humans don't get to see those effects. But this one happened over the course of like decades, I believe. Um, yeah, so someone in the, in the class talked about, uh, there's another course um, in our department, which is Computer Science 3201, which is um, nature-inspired computing, which goes into a lot more details about this sort of stuff. So if you like this, definitely take that course. So here's what happened. During the Industrial Revolution, there was a ton of pollution being sent out into the air, okay? So what happened because of this evolution was that the, 
the tree trunks of surrounding trees became darker, right? Because of all the soot and the ash and stuff like that. So this wasn't necessarily changing the DNA of the trees. It was just changing the outside of the trees because all of this soot and ash and stuff just made the trees darker over time. So in the environment, native to that environment before the Industrial Revolution, was this organism, this moth here, called the peppered moth. And the peppered moth lived on these trees, which naturally were lighter colored. And so this, e this moth had evolved over time to be colored um, approximately the same color as these trees, right? Because it, it blended in with the trees so it wouldn't be eaten by um, birds. So for example here, we have an example where we have a moth that is the same color as the tree trunk and a moth that is not the same color as a tree trunk. If you're a bird flying by, right, or if you're a predator, you want to be able to see your food and the moth wants to be able to not be seen by the thing that wants to eat it. So if you're a bird flying by, you're probably going to see a differently colored moth, but you're not going, maybe not going to see the moth that's the same color. And so over time what had happened was these moths evolved to be lighter colored because the trees in the area were lighter colored. Because the ones that weren't lighter colored, for whatever reason, they got eaten and couldn't reproduce. But now what happened, the Industrial Revolution came along and all of the trees turned dark. And so what happened was, through genetic mutations, okay, through genetic mutations, some of the light colored moths randomly were dark colored. But before, the reason that these darker colored moths weren't surviving is because the birds were eating them, right? Because they weren't the same color as their environment. But now what happened was, because the environment changed color, because the tree trunks changed color, the the phenotypic traits of this moth being darker colored survived to the next generation. Because, for example, if there's one part of the genetic code making this dark and one part of the genetic code making this light, then as the darker moths survive longer, they reproduce more, and their genes are going on to the next generation. And so the genes of the darker moths probably produce darker offspring. Right? So in the first generation, maybe we just have one or two of these really dark moths, but they can reproduce because they're not being eaten so readily. Now in the next generation, we have more dark moths. The next generation, we have more and more and more up until the point where now we've completely reversed the genetics, or at least the genetics that cause the colors in this moth, right? Whereas before we had moths which were lightly colored and now we have moths with her, which are darker colored. And no, these moths weren't just being colored dark by the soot in the air, these were actually genetically different, okay? So that is a process of evolution. Now, these moths did not learn to be darker colored, right? Some people think that evolution is this process of like learning over time. No, 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 no. Evolution is because of possibly random genetic mutations, you, you get born with a new trait. And that new trait may help you to survive better than other individuals in the environment. And then as you pass off your genetic code, you are passing on the traits that made you different, that made you be able to survive more. And over time, um, if your genes are the ones that help individuals survive, then those genes propagate and all of a sudden the population becomes more like you. So that is the process of genetic or of, uh, of evolution. So what's the motivation then for evolutionary computation? Well, nature has always served as an inspiration for engineers and scientists, right? We can see all over the place, Fibonacci sequence is all over the place in engineering. We've, we, we are inspired by, by what's around us. So developing new problem-solving methods or algorithms is a central theme in, in math and computer science. And as we go on, as computers get faster, as life and technology gets more complicated, the complexity of the problems that we want to solve is increasing. So we need to have robust problem-solving technology in order to solve these more and more complicated problems that we see over time. So, 
problems may be too complex for existing algorithms to solve. So let's try using evolution, <coughs> excuse me, as a problem solving algorithm. So let's encode evolution and try and use it. So evolutionary computing can simulate the evolutionary process with millions and millions of generations. Unlike an actual organism that needs to live out its life, right, maybe over the course of, of years or even decades, um, we have computers. We can simulate possibly thousands or millions of generations in just a few seconds or minutes. So if we can model the problem, so we take our problem and model it in terms of an environment, we can model the individual, and we can model the fitness, perhaps evolutionary computation can provide our solutions. So here's just one example of that, okay? So let's say we're trying to solve a very complex problem. So a, a complex problem might be exam scheduling at our university, right? So what are the components of that problem? So the components may be, well, we have a bunch of professors, we have a bunch of students, we have a bunch of rooms, we have a bunch of cor courses, and we have a bunch of time slots. So these are the, this is the environment that we're working in here for exam scheduling. And we're gonna have some constraints that we wanna satisfy on this problem. So for example, no student and no professor should have more than one exam at a time. Okay, so students should be, shouldn't be scheduled two exams at a time, and also professors shouldn't be scheduled two exams at a time. We also don't want any single room to have more than one exam in it at a time. That would be a bit awkward, right? Also, uh, we don't want, for example, any student to have more than three exams in a day. So two exams in a day, that's enough, okay? So this has a gigantic, gigantic search space. So if we talked about using heuristic search for this, for example, it might be too big because the search tree would just be enormous, right? Maybe we have hundreds of profs, 20,000 students, a bunch of different rooms and courses. It's just too big. So what we could do here is we might be able to say, okay, let's try genetic programming or let's try um, evolutionary computation for this. And so what we could do is we could say, well, an individual might be a schedule and the fitness might be the validity of that schedule. So let me just go to my blackboard over here and uh, we'll see what I mean by that. So let's say that we have uh, the following. So this is the, uh, the metaphor of the, or the example of, of computation. So let's say we have here a weekly schedule, right? Or this is just going to be uh, all the days on which exam, this is some sort of calendar, whether it's monthly or weekly or yearly or whatever, right? This is essentially going to be um, the time slots that an exam could be in. So let's say we number all of these time slots. Like this is one, two, three, four, um, five. This might, this is what, like 14 down here. This is 19 or this is 24 whatever it is, okay? So these are our, um, pop, this is our calendar slash time slots. So here's how we would model this. Our genotype, or up here, okay, actually our phenotype, this would be a candidate, this would be an individual for a genetic algorithm or for any of our evolutionary computation. So I need to be able to model this at, to look like a sort of gene, okay? So we'll, we'll get into this in a little bit. Um, yeah, there's a six. That, that's a five. You, you know what I'm talking about here. It's just we've individually numbered all the possible times that there could be um, exams. So up here, what we have is an array. And this is just one type of evolutionary computation called a genetic algorithm. But I just want to show you how we do the mapping here. So what we could have is we could have, ah, uh, let me, uh, I want to erase these things up here. So let me get the uh, proper, come on, there we go. So I want to erase these. Okay, so up here, what this array represents is going to be a candidate schedule. So this schedule is going to be as follows.
So maybe this first cell represents when the exam for 3200 is. Maybe this one represents when the exam for 4300 is. Maybe this one is 3201 and so on and so forth. So for every course at the university, we would have one slot in this array. Okay. Now what we do is an individual is going to be a mapping from these courses to a slot for the exam. Okay. And so that's how we would attempt to solve this problem is we would have an individual be a candidate solution. So this is a possible schedule, right? And the schedule, um, would then what we could do is we could go and evaluate that schedule based on, um, our, our rules that we had listed in the slide. So for example, if we see a one and a two here, you know, that may satisfy our, our constraints, like they're not in the same room and they're not at the same time. And so this is sort of how we would map a problem into the genetic algorithm space, just, just as, a, as an example. And this will become much more obvious as we go on um, in the slides. So the metaphor for all of this um, is the following. So a population of individuals exists in an environment with limited resources. Um, Competition for those resources causes selection of fitter individuals that are better adapted to live in that environment. Those individuals reproduce to form a new generation of individuals through recombination and mutation. New individuals have their fitness evaluation. High fitness individuals are chosen to reproduce and pass on good traits. Over time, natural selection causes overall fitness to rise. So if we look at this as sort of a, uh, uh, as a, as a graph here, we, what we're going to do as an algorithm is we're going to initialize an initial population, uh, an initial population. Okay. What we normally do is we are going to say, here's a bunch of random individuals. Then we're going to have some parent selection process. So we're going to produce some parents. Those parents are going to recombine into new individuals and some mutation is going to happen to those, um, children, which is going to produce some offspring. Those offspring are going to have some survivor selection mechanism applied to them. Some of them may die. Some of them may survive. And the ones that survive are going to form the new population. And then we're either going to repeat this process. And usually we repeat it for a given number of generations. Maybe we have a time limit, for example, and then it will terminate. And then the best individual that we have from our final um, generation or our final population, that's going to be our solution to the problem. So here's the algorithm in pseudocode form. What we're going to do first is we're going to initialize the population with some randomized individuals. They don't have to be random, but typically we do use random. And then we're going to repeat until some termination condition. And so that loop was going to repeat. Maybe we want, uh, for example, Maybe we have an hour, so we're going to compute this for an hour. Maybe we want a specific number of generations, or maybe we have, uh, we want to keep going until we reach a certain fitness, for example, or we've solved a problem, right? We have some termination condition that we've put into this. So what happens is we're going to evaluate the population or individual. Um, so we're going to evaluate the individual fitnesses of all the things in the population. We're going to select parents that have a higher fitness. We're going to combine parents to form offspring. We're going to mutate the offspring. And then the next population is going to be those offspring. All right. So that's, that's, that's what an evolutionary algorithm is. And at a, at a high level, this is what all of evolutionary computation is, is it's simulating this process of natural selection and evolution in nature by doing this. Okay. So there are, you've heard me see, say things um, throughout this lecture about different types of evolutionary algorithms. And all of the different types of evolutionary algorithms, they all use this algorithm, this overarching algorithm. This is the algorithm that's used for all of evolutionary computation. Okay. So this is not a genetic algorithm. For example, this is, this is the evolutionary algorithm structure. Now, when we talk about different 
types of evolutionary algorithm. What we're talking about is how we encode the genome or the phenotype, okay? So the representations that we use for the individuals are how we name the evolutionary algorithm. So for example, if we are using binary strings or integers to, repre to represent our individual, then that is, an, is a genetic algorithm. So if we're talking about, hey, I made a genetic algorithm, what you did was you programmed this thing, but you used uh, the individual had an integer-based representation. Next, we have, uh, if we have, say, if we move from, from integers to real-valued vectors, then those are called evolutionary strategies. So again, evolutionary strategies uses the same algorithm, but the representation is different. If our individuals are, say, for example, finite state machines, because we can encode individuals as whatever we want, that's called evolutionary programming. And if we have a tree structure, not necessarily Lisp trees, but if our individuals have a tree structure, then what we have is genetic programming. And I'll talk about that um, in the next lecture. So these differences are largely cosmetic. And so what you do is you choose the representation which best suits your problem space. And you choose your variation operators, such as recombination and mutation, to suit the representation. Okay? So these algorithms are, in large part, the only difference between those algorithms are just the how you represent the individual and not the overall process of evolution. So the main components, then, of an evolutionary argument evolutionary algorithm are representation, so that's how you define the individuals, the evaluation or fitness function that you use to evaluate individuals, the population size and shape, the parent selection mechanism, so how you actually go about choosing the parents, excuse me, uh, the variation operators, so variation being recombination of parents and mutation of offspring, and the survivor selection mechanism. Okay, so for example, do you kill off some of the offspring or do you let all the offspring go? So, the candidate solutions or individuals exist in the phenotype space. So the phenotype is an actual candidate solution. They are encoded in chromosomes which exist in a genotypic space. So the genotype is the representation of the phenotype. So the encoding of the uh, phenotype, so we go from phenotype to genotype and the decoding of genotype to phenotype. So I'll, I'll give an example of this to make that clear in a second. So in order to find the global optimal, every possible s solution must be represented in the genotype space. So whatever your representation is, you have to be able to um, represent every possible candidate solution in order to ensure that it is at least possible to find the global optimum. Okay, so what do I mean by genotype and phenotype? Well, here's a very um, good example, which is going to be our assignment four. So in assignment four, we're going to be looking at solving a Sudoku with a genetic algorithm. Okay, so obviously Sudoku are integer based. And what we're going to do is we're going... The, the Sudoku board candidate solution, which is an actual filling out of a Sudoku board, that is the phenotype, okay? So the phenotype is an actual solution candidate. So the phenotype is the Sudoku board, all right? The genotype is the encoding of the phenotype that our genetic algorithm will actually use as an individual. So... The genotype, for our case, we want to have a one-dimensional array. And pretty much for any genetic algorithm, our individuals will be represented by a one-dimensional array of integers. Okay? It's like it's just like DNA, right? We just kind of have boom, 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 all the integers. And how we're going to do that translation is different for every problem. But for example, in Sudoku, it's very it's an easy translation. All we have to do is go through our array, 
The first thing in the top left is going to be the first element. The next thing is the next element. The next thing is the next element. The next thing is the next element. Then we go all the way through. We go to the next row. We go to the next row. And eventually we get down here to the bottom where we have this one. We have this one. And we have this one. So we've already talked about this, this course. This is just unfolding a two-dimensional array into a one-dimensional array. So the actual solution candidate that we're going to be running our fitness function on, that's the phenotype. The representation inside the genetic algorithm is called the genotype. Okay, that I'm, I'm repeating it because it's definitely going to be somewhere on an exam. Okay, so what do we do for the fitness function then? So the fitness function represents the requirements that the population should adapt to. So unlike nature, where nature applies the fitness, right? So in, in nature, you're, you're a specific individual and based on what's going on around you, whether or not you've been eaten or you've, you've reproduced, right? That is your secondary fitness. In an evolutionary algorithm, we have to provide the fitness function, okay? Uh, that's a function we actually have to write. So it assigns a real valued fitness to each phenotype, which forms the basis for selection. So the more fine-grained different values, the better, okay? So the, the, the better, um, the more fine-grained your fitness function, the better solutions that you'll have. So typically, we talk about fitness being maximized. Some problems you may want to minimize fitness, but that's just the same problem, it's just flipped, okay? So here's an example fitness function. Um, let's say, and this is a screenshot from an older version of, of the assignment four, when the course used to be different. Um, so say we have a Sudoku board here, okay? What I've done as just a possible fitness function is the following. Let's go through each row and each column and count up the number. So if, if you don't know what Sudoku is, I apologize. Let me explain the rules of Sudoku. In Sudoku, you have a nine by nine grid, which is also separated into a three by three grid of three by three squares. In Sudoku, what you're trying to do in order to solve the puzzle is get a one through nine in each of the rows, each of the columns, and each of the squares. So um, if we just generate like a random board of integers, it's incredibly unlikely that we're going to have an actual solved Sudoku board. So what could be a possible fitness function for Sudoku then? Well, ideally we would want a solved puzzle to have the highest possible fitness and a puzzle that had maybe all the same value to have the lowest possible fitness. So what I did here, just as an example, is I wrote a fitness function which goes through each row and column and counts the number of um, unique individuals in each row and column. So here, for example, we have eight, nine, six, two, four, one, right? So there's six unique individuals in this, in this row. There's seven in this one, eight in this one, six in this one. So for example, um, that could be a fitness function, counting up the number of unique individuals in each row and column, right? So we're just coming up with a fitness function that as this function gets higher, we are ideally getting closer and closer to a solved Sudoku board. But one of the things that you're gonna do on your assignment is I've provided with you with, with some sample code for a Sudoku board and you're going to write your own fitness function to, to try and get a better genetic algorithm working. So this is just an example of a fitness function. Um, another fitness function may be, just for example, um, maybe we want to, to have uh, the highest possible number. So we're no longer talking about Sudoku. Maybe we could just have the sum of all the numbers be the fitness function. And then what would happen is over time, instead of solving a Sudoku, what we would have is we just have nines all through the board. And we'll talk about that tomorrow when we get to, or on Thursday when we actually talk about the assignment. So the population then is going to hold possible solutions, okay? So you're going to hold the genotypes in the population. It usually has a fixed size. So we're gonna say, we're gonna have a population of size 200. So every generation is gonna have 200 individuals. 
Some sophisticated EAs uh, assert a special structure on the population. So for example, maybe we have a grid or a tree or whatever, but we won't worry about that right now. Um, what we're going to do for ours is just a collection of arrays. So we're going to have an array of arrays, basically. The selection operator usually takes the whole population into account. So the whole current generation, we're going to look over that and find possible uh, solutions. Um, sorry, I just got a, I got a phone call that I didn't mute. So the diversity of the population is going to refer to uh, the number of different fitnesses or phenotypes or genotypes, okay? So the population diversity over time, we're gonna talk about this a little bit more next time, but actually, yes, let me talk about that next time. Essentially, we want diverse populations, but uh, these slides don't make a lot of sense to you because I haven't shown you the assignment yet. Parent selection mechanism. The parent selection mechanism, we're going to assign probabilities of individuals as parents de depending on their fitness. So it's usually probabilistic. So high quality solutions are more likely to reproduce, so be a parent, but it's not guaranteed, okay? Worst candidates usually have a non-zero chance. So we, we usually don't want to say that things are going to have a zero chance of reproducing because we want that genetic variation to continue on. But essentially, the higher your fitness, the higher your chance of being chosen as a parent. And this stochastic nature can help escape local optima, and we'll talk about that in a bit. So one mechanism that we're going to be using and that you will have to um, implement on the next assignment is, um, is called roulette wheel selection. And so roulette wheel selection or dartboard selection, essentially what we're going to do is we're going to, based on an individual's fitness, scale its chance of being selected as a parent based on that, excuse me, based on that fitness. So for example, the fittest individual is going to be given a larger section of the roulette wheel. Um, the less fit individuals are going to be given a smaller slice of the roulette wheel. And then we're just gonna spin the wheel, right? And, and wherever it lands, that's going to be apparent. It's also called dartboard selection because you could just imagine closing your eyes and throwing a dart and wherever it lands, that is your um, parent that you're gonna use. So this is um, that. Now, how do we implement that? Well, here's an, ex here's an example of how to actually implement roulette wheel selection that you're going to do on your assignment. So let me actually go back to the blackboard to show you this because I think it's easier to explain this algorithm. Um, as the following, uh, uh, like visually than it is um, programmatically. So let's go back to the blackboard. So let's say here, here's the entire algorithm. We're gonna have a bunch of individuals, right? So all of these down here are going to be individuals and we're gonna apply fitness to them. So let's say just for example, that this one had a fitness of 10. Oops, this one had a fitness of 10. This one has a fitness of 30. This one has a fitness of 100, this one has a fitness of 5, and this one has a fitness of, of 20, okay? So we have our population of individuals, and we're going to be giving them all some fitness with our fitness function. So we've given them all fitnesses. Now what we're going to do is we're going to sum up all of these numbers. So someone out there calculate that for me. What is it? 40, 140, 145, 165. So the sum of fitness equals 165. Oops, that's not visible on your screen. There we go. So the sum of the fitnesses is 165. Now what they're going now what now what we're going to do is just generate a random number between 1 and 165. So let's say that number was I don't know um, 120. Okay? So we've generated a random number between 165, 1 and 165, and now we've got we've gone um, to 120. So what we're going to do, we're going to start here, and we're going to keep a running sum of of fitnesses so far. So here I, I start with zero, right? So up here I have zero. That's my running sum. Now I have I add the fitness of the next individual, which is 10, 
And one way to do this roulette wheel selection is just add the fitness of the next individual. And then if my current sum is greater than the random number that I generated, then I pick that individual. So is 10 greater than 120? No. So what I do is I add the fitness of the next individual and I get to 40. Is this number greater than 120? No, it isn't. So I go to the next individual and I go 140. Is this number greater than 120? Yes, it is. And so for this round of parent selection, I'm going to pick this value right here. Okay, so what this does is it simulates that roulette wheel spin. Now let's generate a new random number. Let's say we picked um, our new random number is going to be uh, 12, for example, right? We got 12. So here we go to 10. Is 10 bigger than 12? No, it isn't. So we're not going to select that one. Uh, now we have 40. So is 40 bigger than 12? Yes, it is. So here we've, uh, we've gotten 30 as our random number to be selected. And if you work out the math for all this, this linearly scales um, the chance of being chosen as a parent with the actual fitness, okay? Now it turns out that sometimes maybe what you want to do is you want to have high individual fitness be like a way better chance of, um, of being chosen. So what you could do is say whenever you do this roulette wheel selection, you're going to say maybe square the value of the fitness. So here this would be 100, this might be uh, 900, this would be uh, 10,000, right? This would be 25, and this would be 400. So here what we've done is we've said instead of 100 having a approximately three times chance of being selected as 30 fitness, maybe we wanted to have a way bigger chance of being selected as a fitness. So it's not necessary that roulette wheel selection be applied linearly like this. Um, you may want to scale your fitnesses somehow, but essentially what we're doing it here is that roulette wheel um, selection algorithm. So if we come back uh, to the PowerPoint, then this is the function that implements that, okay? So we've got roulette wheel selection based on the population. We are going to calculate the fitnesses of all of our individuals, which we just showed. We're going to take the maximum, that's the maximum value that we're going to choose for our random number, and that's just the sum of all the population fitnesses. Then we're going to pick a random number between zero and that maximum. We're going to have a current sum which we set to zero and we're going to uh, go you can tell that this course was in Python the first time it was uh, it was it was offered so for one to the length of the population so for every individual we say that uh, we're gonna add current we're gonna add the fitness to the current sum and then if that value is greater than the random number we picked then that individual is going to be chosen for our um, roulette wheel selection. Okay, so really easy algorithm and you're going to be implementing that for assignment four. Next we're going to talk about the variation operators. So the role of the variation operators is to generate new candidate solutions. So from parents to children. So once we've selected the parents using our roulette wheel selection, and again, roulette wheel selection is not the only way to choose parents, it's just the way that we're going to do it on our assignment. It's usually divided into two types according to the number of inputs, okay? So mutation operators have one input because you're just going to take in a single individual and mutate it somehow. But a recombination operator is going to have multiple inputs. Usually it's going to be two and those two inputs are going to be the two parents, okay? If we have two inputs, this is called crossover and most evolutionary algorithms use both crossover and mutation. So, crossover mutation, what does it look like? Well, what we're going to be doing for assignment four is sort of the most basic possible form of crossover and mutation. So here, let's say we have two parents. So the green vector here, the green array, that's one parent that we've chosen, and the blue array is another parent that we've chosen. These are going to produce two children, okay? And the children are going to be essentially just the first half of one parent, and the second half of the other parent. So these two parents are going to be combined to form these two new children. Okay? So that's it. That's what we're doing in the assignment. We're doing that form of very basic crossover. For mutation, there's two types of mutation that we could do. Uh, 
Um, one is called uh, swapping, where we're going to take two elements and we're going to swap them, right? So we could have just a single input for, for mutation. And what we could do is just swap two random elements. Or, and what we're going to be doing in our assignment, what we're going to be do is just flipping a bit, right? Well, we're going to be using integers, but essentially we're going to have a range of integers, which is one to nine for Sudoku. And we're going to choose, when, whenever we choose to mutate something, we're going to take a random value inside that Sudoku array, and we're going to change it to another random number. Okay, so that's going to be the mutation for our assignment. Then we have the last step, which is survivor selection. Um, it's also called environmental selection. And so most EAs are going to use a fixed population size. And we need a way from going from the parents or offspring to a new generation. So it's often deterministic, but it doesn't have to be. Um, what we could do in terms of selecting the new population, it could be fitness based. So for example, we could rank all of our individuals and, and select some of them. It could be age-based, so we could select um, intentionally the newer um, units. Or it could be elitism. So we could say, okay, the best N always survive in our new population. So essentially we've got parents, we have a way to make new offspring, and so how do we actually form the next population? I'll get into that a little bit more um, when we talk about the assignment, but I've chosen some settings for us and you'll just have to code up those settings. Lastly, we have the initialization and terminal, termina termination of our actual algorithm. So the initialization is usually done randomly. So we need to ensure an even mixture of candidates and we can include existing solutions or heuristics if we want to, but for our assignment, we're just gonna have a whole population of completely random individuals. And the termination condition is going to be when we reach some known or desired fitness, when we reach a generation limit, when we reach a minimum diversity, or, or whatever, okay? Um, in our assignment, you're, you're going to keep going until you find a solution, essentially, because we have a, a, a Sudoku, which we know that it's either solved or it's not solved. So one other thing I wanted to talk about is um, the typical behavior of a genetic algorithm. So let's say that this is the solution space of our of all possible um, individuals in a um, in an environment. So here we can treat this as a graph, where on the y-axis we have fitness, and down here we have different individuals. Oh, okay. Trying to type with the, with the mouse is not good. All right. So here, for example, these black dots are going to represent randomly chosen individuals. Okay? So we randomly choose these individuals, and now we evaluate their fitness. And what we get are some of them are a little bit higher than others. Okay? But what's going to happen is the following. Genetic algorithms do something that's known as hill climbing. Hill climbing is a type of optimization that finds local optima really, really well, but hopefully finds global optima as well. So for example, let's say we're at a particular Sudoku board solution. If all we're doing is flipping and flipping some little, um, some of the numbers in a Sudoku board, what we may be doing is getting this fitness value higher and higher, as in there are fewer and fewer Sudoku violations going on. And so when we do that, let's say we take these guys here, okay, these individuals, and we're going to recombine them to the next generation, we're going to mutate them, and they'll get a little bit better over time. So here we see that these solutions are progressing toward better solutions, right? Their fitness is going up. So before where we were more spread out, now we're going up. And after some number of generations, what has happened is that we now have um, our individuals at these local optima. So local optima are sort of good solutions, but maybe not the best solution. And here's an example of that in Sudoku, okay? And I chose Sudoku specifically to show off how dangerous local maxima, so local minima or local local maxima are. 
So here, after we've run our genetic algorithm for a while, maybe we've produced this board over here on the right. Okay, so this board is pretty good. We've just got a few things here. So for example, um, we've, got a, we've got this situation in which we've got a board almost solved. It's completely almost solved, except there's two ones right here that are conflicting in this column, and there's two threes in here that are conflicting in this column. So if we had our maximum po possible fitness right here, we've gotten to about right here. But what this hump here, this local optima is showing is that in order to change this Sudoku board, in order to give it that last little bit to solve it, we may not actually be able to do that. Because in, as you, if you've ever played Sudoku, you know that you can't just change these values because if you change this one to a five, for example, well, now you'll have a collision with this five, you'll have a collision of this five, and you'll have a collision with this five. So you've actually got a technically a worse solution by going, or, or sorry, you've produced a board with a worse fitness in order to get to the actual solution. So somewhere over here, there exists the optimal Sudoku board, the solved Sudoku board. But in order to get there, you're going to have to take your currently really high fitness Sudoku board and bring it down in fitness in order to possibly get to this hill, which is the one that you should be climbing. And so Sudoku is kind of the worst possible case for this sort of thing, where when you get so, so very close, you get a really high fitness that's really close to the maximum, you may have to go in the opposite direction to get to the actual solved board. And the problem with genetic algorithms is that they can get you really quickly to an almost solved Sudoku board, but rarely will they actually completely solve it, okay? So I gave you Sudoku to sort of teach you that lesson in the harshest possible way of this sort of local maxima. We're getting better and better and better toward this local um, high value, but that may not be the actual highest possible value. Okay, so that's what local maxima are. And so what we do is we may introduce like, for example, random individuals into our population in order to increase genetic diversity, because maybe what we could do is through a random individual mutation and selection, we could jump from one of these solutions to one of these solutions, right? So we wanna keep injecting more variation and stuff into our algorithm. So trying to help our genetic algorithm or our evolutionary algorithm ex escape these local maxima is what a lot of the actual like PhD research stuff that's going on in genetic algorithms, that's what it's trying to do. So we're not gonna go too deep into that. I just want you to know that local maxima are a big problem when it comes to evolutionary computation. Also, one thing I wanted you to know is that, uh, like I said just then, is you're going to get really good solutions or really good individuals really quickly but when it comes to problems like Sudoku, you may never actually get the actual solution. So you really, really quickly get high fitness, but then it's gonna taper off at the end, okay? And we'll show a good example of this when we go over the assignment next time. And so when you're running your genetic algorithm, um, what you get is this sort of uh, thing happening, where most of your progress is going to be in the first half of running. Right? So if you've run your GA for an hour, if you then think running it for two hours is going to give you twice as good solution, you're, uh, that's not going to happen. Okay. So because of the nature of the fitness over time graph with most evolutionary algorithm runs, um, you're going to have diminishing returns as you continue to run your algorithm. So it just means that the solution that you get out is not going to be linearly good with respect to how many generations you have. It's going to get uh, the progress, there's gonna be diminishing returns over time with your running. So again, just as the last slide, we're gonna initialize a population, and then we're gonna repeat forever, evaluate it, test the fitness of all the individuals, select the parents with a high fitness, combine the parents to form offspring, mutate the resulting offspring, and then get the next population. And for assignment four, what you are doing is you are writing these steps. So I'm going to give you a fitness function 
you're going to evaluate the population with the fitness function. You're going to do roulette wheel selection with, uh, with the, the, the population in order to select the parents. You're going to combine those using crossover. You're going to mutate, mutate them, given what we just sh um, showed. And you're going to form the next population based on the, the offspring that you had. So, uh, wow, that was actually really good timing. And we've covered everything for this lecture. So that is the introduction to evolutionary algorithms. And now you know them. In the next, so on um, Thursday, it's a really important lecture because I'm going to be talking about genetic programming, which is um, still, it has this structure, right? It has this evolutionary algorithm structure, but it uses trees as its representation instead of um, just binary vectors. And what's really cool is that we can actually write evolutionary algorithms to write code for us or do machine learning for us. So that's really, really interesting. And also, after I show that, um, that's only going to take about a half an hour. Then we're going to explain assignment four, and I'll give out assignment four. So that's it for this class. Um, thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you on Thursday.